Zana, uh, it's been a pleasure to be here as a speaker for this online course. So in today's session, I'll be talking about quantitative research. So I have, uh, in fact, uh, divided this session into six different parts. So in the first sec and second part, we will focus towards primary on the quantitative research. Why do we need it? How to do quantitative research? And then in the third and fourth part, I will uh, describe the common sampling designs and the, the quantitative research designs, and then we move uh, towards the, the difference between qualitative and quantitative research in the fifth part of this presentation. And lastly, we will discuss uh, or we will look at the four key questions that are quite important when we look at the quality of the research. So let's get started that why do we need uh, quantitative research? So there could be different reasons for different people, but I have listed here six, and one of them is if we want to test or examine the testing interventions and treatments, for example, we have two treatments and we want to know whether the treatment A is better performing in terms of um, uh, uh, speedier outcomes than treatment B, then we, we usually try to conduct this, the quantitative research. So the second important thing when we want to conduct the, the quantitative research is the finding the differences between groups. So for example, I have medication A and I'm interested to know how that specific medication is affecting for men as compared to women. So this could be the second possible way of looking at uh, the quantitative research. And the third one, if we have uh, two or more than two variables, then we are more interested in the relationship between them. And in that context, we can look at the quantitative research study. So one possible example is something like, uh, for example, if we want to know, is there uh, an active relation between crime rate and education. So in order to answer this question, we have to look at the quantitative research study. And other important aspect that we can examine using quantitative research is the description of population and phenomena. So for example, if I'm as a researcher is interested to know uh, which ethnic groups are experiencing higher rates of heart disease, so in order to answer this question, I have to, again, uh, look at the quantitative research methods. And then sometimes it happens that we are interested to know the phenomena over time. For example, from the voting behavior of different uh, voters in a particular constituency from one election to another election. So we can think this as a change over time. So this is another aspect that we have to consider when we uh, want to conduct the quantitative research. So how to do all these uh, things using a quantitative approach? There are usually seven, at least these seven steps that we have to follow. So the very first step, we have to select the topic. And then after selecting a topic, we have to narrow it down to a specific research questions or hypothesis, and then we start to design our study. And after designing the study, we collect the data using different methods, could be questionnaire, could be experiments or surveys. And then after collecting the data, we analyze, interpret, and disseminate our findings. So I would like to explain all these steps in a little more depth. For example, uh, the very first step is select a topic. So how can we select a topic? So there could be different ways of selecting the topic. For example, if someone is interested um, in exploring the, the behavior of votes in a specific constituency. So he might look into the research papers which are specifically related to that particular topic. So if we read the research papers, so at the end of the research papers, usually nearby the conclusion or discussion session, authors usually give hints that what are the future directions. So this could be one of the ways of selecting the topic. We can read those discussions or we can look at the, the sections which are labeled as future directions, or sometimes we can select a topic uh, from, uh, from an agency or business needs point of view. For example, if there is a business organization and they are facing a specific problem in their business. So to solve that problem, we can come up with the specific topic and we can 
also select the topic by using the intellectual curiosity. So these three are just the, the, the three labels things that I have uh, uh, here put here, but there could be many more options which can be useful for selecting a topic. So if I talk about my personal research, so it is motivated from the social phenomena. For instance, if you are going to analyze the voting behavior or specific uh, constituency, then how the minor parties would affect that behavior and how the major party would affect that behavior. So that's how we usually select a topic. So one step that is not given in that diagram, and I feel that is a quite key step when it comes to conduct the quantitative research that is related to exploring or conducting a literature review. So usually uh, there are different types of literature review, but I personally prefer to go for systematic literature review, and it is conducted in a systematic manner. conduct the systematic literature review. So after selecting the topic, we try to assess the current state of the literature related to the selected topic. And in order to do that, we usually ask the question, has the topic already been studied to the point that the question in which different perspective? If it is not, then we try to come up with something new. So, so systematic literature review is really useful when we conduct the quantitative research, though quantitative researchers, apart from the, the, the biological side or biosciences, they usually don't mostly try to conduct this systematic literature review in social sciences. So the second step is focus questions, because when we have, we have conducted the literature review, we have uh, the, selected the topic, but the topic is too broad to study. So we want to come up with some specific questions, specific hypotheses, and in order to do that, we have to conduct different things. And one of them is just to understand what is meant by hypothesis. So hypothesis basically uh, is used it are the statements which are uh, about the expected relationship between two concepts. So for example, if I'm interested to know what is the, the, the relationship between crime and intelligence. So here, uh, this could be my hypothesis. But if I want to operationalize it, it means how would I measure that specific variable crime and intelligence? And what would be the concept? How would I define them? So these two steps comes uh, really important when it comes to focus uh, down the questions. And then um, after thinking about these two hypotheses and operationalization, we can also, we, we should also keep that in our mind that how can we narrow down our uh, research questions? How can we think a good research question? So there are different ways which usually different researchers use, uh, but I have highlighted here the final criteria. The final criteria is basically consists of five different verbs. So one is F for the feasible, and then the interesting, the question should be interesting, it should be novel, it should be ethical, it should be relevant to the, the knowledge. So, so whenever we are going to tailor a research question, a good research question should at least have these five criteria. So by feasibility, I mean whether we have adequate number of subjects, whether we have expertise, whether we have the time and scope, and can we manage that research question within the time span is loaded? Can we have that much money to um, or to answer that question? And whether that question is interesting? And when it comes to novelty, so novelty is different for different people, but usually novelty can be considered which add something new to the existing knowledge. And then we should also think about ethical requirements. And those requirements are usually set by institutional review boards and each university usually have uh, their ethical boards. And if we want to conduct the research as a researcher, then we have to take the ethical, ethical uh, form approval from that university or that agency for which we are going to conduct the research. And then our research question should also be relevant to the, to the, the I mean, to the research, it should also be relevant to the present and should also be relevant to the future of that particular topic. So 
The third step is designing the study. So when we talk about designing the study, it means we have to develop the research plan and methodology. So the, the methodology is the, it's basically a plan, a research plan on how to conduct, uh, how the research question will be answered and will uh, detail. So in methodology, we are more interested to know that what would be our research groups, what would be the subjects of our, our interest, what would be our population, and all the questions which usually come under the, the realm of the sampling techniques. I will discuss uh, about this in a moment that what are the sampling techniques and what are the sampling signs available. And then uh, we should also keep in our mind that what research design we are going to use. And these two things should be uh, correspond or appropriately designed in a way that which relates to our search question. So in other words, research questions are important and they help us to select a specific research design and sampling design as well. And then the fourth step is collecting the data. So we can collect data using experiments, questionnaires, surveys, or sometimes the data is already collected by someone else and we can just uh, take that data uh, uh, from different databases. For instance, in Pakistan, they have the Bureau of Statistics and here in the UK, they have the Office of National Statistics and there are many other such bureaus are available uh, in different uh, countries. And if we want to, for example, particularly research here in uh, on the criminology. So we have to collect the data through Home Office site and uh, different other databases. So after collecting the data, the most important thing is whether that data is transfer, we have to transfer the data into the form of numbers. And if we have something like categorical data, like male, female, or ethnicity and things like that, we have to pre-code them before uh, running the analysis. So after collecting the data, we have to transfer data into a computer readable format because at the end of the day, we are going to analyze the data using some kind of software. And those software which are usually popular nowadays are the SPSS in social sciences and, and R, and sometimes people use Python in data science as well. So when we want to analyze the data, then we have to think a few things. First of all, we have to think what are variables we have in our study, whether those variables are quantitative or categorical, whether those variables are on the nominal scales or ordinal scales, whether those variables are on the ratio scales, because these things determine that what kind of the method or research technique we're going to use. So this is really important con uh, aspect, uh, which I have not uh, included in depth here because I'm assuming that uh, majority of students are not from statistical background. So that's why I'm just uh, giving the basic uh, briefly overview. For instance, if we have quantitative data and we want to explore the relationships between two uh, quantitative variables, we may think of regression analysis, or we may think of maybe t-test if we are interested to compare the averages between two groups. So these all things come under uh, the data analysis. And if we have, for example, qualitative data, then we probably would not like to, as a statistician or maybe as a researcher, would like to find out the averages. We are more interested in the proportions and we are interested to know how this proportion significantly differ with different categories. So it all depends uh, what kind of data we have. So after analyzing the data, the main, uh, uh, the sixth step is to interpret your results and then disseminating your findings. So these are uh, the things, or these are the steps that we involve in, uh, that we have for conducting our quantitative research. So if anyone has questions about these steps, so I'm more than happy to answer those questions. And then I move after that to the, the other part of the, the presentation that is related to something. Zishan, you were so perfectly clear <laughs> that, they haven't had questions, but everybody wants the video and the recording. Uh, Mahanoor Ali from Psychology, our campus, she says, let me see, where did it go? We can make exploratory comparison between groups in qualitative uh, research. I do not know, and what so are some other types of literature reviewed? So these are two questions from Sarah and Mahanoor. Okay, could you, could you please repeat the question? Uh... 
Yeah, the question in the chat yeah. is we can make, can we? I, I think she wants to know if she can make an exploratory comparison between groups, of course, in qualitative research. Okay, so, so, so uh, I mean, I'm understanding that she's asking probably the what are the different uh, literature reviews available? This is a question. Which I yeah, one answer. question yeah. is about literature review and the yeah. other is about exploratory groups, you know, comparison between groups in quality. Of course, yes, in qualitative, uh, quanti yeah. quantitative research, it's not qualitative research. Okay. Know we are right now in quantitative research. G. Okay, so so I think so. Uh, I mean, what I understand from uh, if you, you want to explore your data, so uh, I, I'm not quite sure is this on the ordinal scale or nominal scale. So I'm assuming this data is just kind of kind kind of I mean quantitative data. So if you want to know the the gaps or want to explore it, there are different ways of doing that. If you have two quantitative variables, you can think of a scatter plot and you can find out uh, how the change in one variable may have effect in the change of the other variable. Or if you have multiple, uh, for instance, quantitative variable, and one of them you have, I mean, you have to determine which one is the response, which one is the quantitative, uh, is independent variable. So response is usually the one which is affected uh, from the other variables. For instance, if I want to know the relationship between academic stress and say, uh, uh, maybe uh, due to gender, how they, Respond. So, 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 in that particular example, we have a classification problem, right? Hmm. And if I want to know the, for 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 example, I want to explore how the crime rate is increasing, uh, and with respect to, for example, the the education level, which is measured in percentages. So here you can just draw the scatter plot and find out the the differences. And if you have uh, multiple, uh say continuous variables or something like that, or quantity variables, you can go matrix plots, hmm. okay? So yeah. so another way of exploring the same thing could be something like histograms, if you want to do individually, or you can do cluster analysis. So there's a lot of things which can be used to explore the data. So in terms of uh, the second question, which was related to literature review, so I'm aware of the two of the literature reviews. One is, uh, uh, usually known as the narrative literature review, in which you just try to pick different research papers according to your topic and you explain the themes. Uh, and the other one is uh, systematic, in which you just don't pick any of the you know uh, paper. You have a systematic way of doing that. Uh, hmm. So I'm, I'm aware of these two things. Okay, I, I see. Yeah, I, I see some more. It was just a comment, Manu. Thank you. Sadak um, Amin from um, the Textile Department, Lahore College Women University. Uh, no, I think that's nothing. I am from the background of Earth Sciences, uh, University of Punjab, Muhammad Anjum. My question is how, how to construct the uh, idea from topic selection to literature review to defining objectives. That's, I think you mean research questions or whatever, right? how to construct the idea. Now, this is uh, the process that he's talking about, that after you have done uh, this topic selection from literature review, how do you go on from uh, these different? And I think it depends upon the study. I think in the previous session, uh, Sarah did clarify that you have to find out a niche, and perhaps you said that too, Zeeshan, that you have to find where research is needed and has already happened, then it's no use reinventing the wheel unless you are doing a different context for the same research. Sometimes when you change the context, you can follow the same model, but you apply it in a different setting and that becomes a different research altogether. So research is not about having done something and that stands true for all times, for all situations and for all populations or samples. So there is a lot of variation in there. So you have to first read the lot of material in the sub theme and allow me if Zishan, I'm saying it right. And once you have read it and read other researches, I think the best way, and we have discussed it earlier in one of our sessions is to start from latest um, journal articles from where and then go to some basic research. You know, we had those big journals 
Now you have data sets that you will put on a search in that data set, digital data set, and it will throw you papers after a certain timeline. So you can even date it that I want all the latest research done on this topic since 2015. And it will give you a whole deal of material on that. So I think it becomes very easy. We used to do it in the library by those cards and the librarians used to direct us. And we had those huge journals where every article published was, you know, by, uh, was, you know, printed. And you had to go through those thick books and big ones and you couldn't even carry one and read under that heading to find out what had already been done in a certain time period. So I think you're talking about a different process. Simple, I would say, put it in Gemini or chat GPT and the process will be very clear. Can we move on to systematic reviews itself, very comprehensive, and we find research or articles on it? Would, to, would it be fine with an article with quantitative methodology or more appropriate for thesis I'm writing? I have not understood the question, Maria. You are from National University of uh, uh, NAML stands for modern languages. So uh, I, did you make sense of this, Zishan, as to what um, Maria is saying? Systematic is very common. We find search articles. Would it be fine with an article with quantitative methodology? Why not? I mean, quantitative methodology doesn't come because a certain of time of review of literature is done. I mean, you decide on the basis of the question if you want it qualitative or quantitative and what would be more appropriate for you. Uh, I don't understand, please clarify. Uh, um, okay, I can. we can continue, there are no other questions. What is the exact way to do systematic literature review? Okay, Afshin, uh, Zishan, please. Yeah, there are, there are different approaches they use uh, to yeah. conduct the systematic literature review, which I personally like is the PRISMA approach that is used in uh, biosciences. There is another approach which is called, I think, so PCORD, but the PRISMA is, uh, they, they have put the clear cut criterion that how to identify uh, the, the studies, and then you screen those studies and then you have exclusion, exclusion criteria and then you conduct your research. So in fact, systematic literature review is itself is a methodology. Hmm. So, so if you're going some, to, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Somebody wrote that Prisma model, uh, Saima Majid, yeah. so thank you so much, yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so the, the next part of this presentation is about the sampling, uh, because this is one of the core things that is uh, used in quantitative research, and that's why I've uh, given a little bit more uh, um, space in that presentation to this specific topic. So the sampling is basically uh, is, uh, is the process of selecting a small uh, group from a large group uh, in hope that studying this uh, small group will reveal important things about the larger group. And uh, in order to uh, think more about sampling, we should keep some key terms in our mind. Uh, one is the target population. So target population is the totality of uh, the, the things that we have uh, and the total set of subjects in which we are interested. And if we take a part or the subset of those uh, in order to uh, run some statistical analysis, uh, that is called, I mean, that specific part is called the sample. And uh, the sample is selected in a different way. I discuss this uh, in a moment. Uh, but usually in quantitative research, we prefer to select the sample randomly instead of doing some uh, non-random things. Uh, then we, the third key uh, topic or the key, uh, key term is the sampling frame. The sampling frame is basically the list of the objects in the population from which we want to draw the sample. And the method that we would use to draw the sample is called the sampling design. And then there is the last term which we should keep in our mind that is related to sampling error. And this is just the difference between the results or outcomes that between the sample and a population. So now uh, there are, uh, let's, let's have a look at the different sampling designs. Uh, 
broadly speaking, there are two types of uh, uh, sampling methods. One is probability sampling. The other one is non-probability sampling. So for this talk, I have focused just on uh, the probability sampling. So there are four key, or maybe uh, there is one, I mean, these one of them is usually used in uh, in the in the practical research mostly. Uh, the one the, the the first one is a simple a simple random sampling, and then the second type of probability sampling, the stratified sampling. The third type is a cluster sampling, and the fourth one is systematic sampling. So we have to be very much careful when we pick one of uh, the sampling method because. If we pick a wrong sampling design, we probably end up with dubious inferences. And at the end of the day, uh, we have wasted our money and all uh, you know, time and energy. So we should be very much careful about that. And then the non-sampling uh, design, which are usually uh, and mostly used in qualitative research. So I'm not going to uh, into detail of them. Uh, so the, the very first is a sampling, uh, simple random sampling. So this is, uh, uh, it's a kind of sampling in which we should keep two things in our mind. One is each unit that is going to be selected in our sample, it should have the non and equal probability of selection. And the second thing, each sample, this is theoretical, I'm speaking practically, each sample of size as say n has, should have the equal chance of selection. So I can demonstrate this, for example, we have a population of three units, say one, two, and three, this is our population and we want to select a sample so there's of size two. So the one sample could be one and two, these two units. The second sample should be uh, could be one and three. The third sample could be unit two and three. So, so, so possible samples here, we have three, but in practice, we should pick one and that should be a representative uh, sample. So here, uh, where they are talking about that each sample should have the equal chance. So here, it is means that uh, if I select, irrespective of whether I pick the, the sample size of one and two, one and three, or with units one or two or three, it should have the same probability of selection. So simple random sampling is basically the most elementary sampling technique, and it forms the basis of other sampling techniques. I'll explain that uh, thing in a moment. Uh, and this is done usually with and without replacement. But in practice, uh, we usually do this without replacement because we, uh, if we have selected a unit, then we usually don't want to replace it and again select it. So the practical way of doing that sampling is that, for example, we have the number of uh, objects or maybe subjects, and we label them from one to n. n could be 1,000, 2,000, whatever the number of total uh, units you have in your population. And then you pick one, a specific number, which is a small n using a random sample uh, table, a random uh, numbers table or generating random uh, numbers from using a program. So that's how we usually select a specific random sample. Or we probably can select, say uh, we have a die and we want to select a six unit from population. For example, we can throw uh, a die and can think of if even a number would come, then I would pick the specific number. And if odd would come, then I would pick a, another kind of number. So we can think uh, that as uh, also as a simple random something. So this is uh, the visual representation. We have a hundred a thousand population uh, unit, for example, and we want, uh, we will label this with a sampling frame. And then from that sampling frame, we select a sample, say hundred, and this should be a representative sample. The second uh, type is a stratified sampling. So systematic sampling is usually used when we have homogeneous units uh, in our population. But when we have uh, heterogeneous units and or when we are interested in uh, heterogeneity of the population, for example, if we want to select a specific sample based on the gender or their income group, then we have to first divide uh, the population in, uh, in homogeneous groups. And then from each group, we pick a sample. And this is called stratified sampling. Uh, so, so demonstration uh, in the form of uh, uh, visualization is some, look like something, uh, something like this. So for example, we have 1,000 population units, and there are 50% male and 50% female. And we want to select a, a, a sample of, say, 100 units, right? And then from these 500 males, we select uh, 50 
by using a simple random sampling technique. And then from these 500 females uh, sampling frames, we selected 50, and that's how we select uh, the stratified random sampling. But here, uh, they have used in this particular uh, diagram, they have used the equal allocation, but we may choose a sample in stratified random sampling with respect to their uh, size in the population. So for example, uh, the other way, uh, if for example, we have a capital N population size, and that is divided into G strata. So here G strata means I have G groups, which are internally homogeneous, but externally they are heterogeneous. And I want to select the size N and want to divide that total population size so, so this is equal allocation. I just divide the, this sample, with, uh, divide by this the number of groups, and from each group, I will select this ni number. And if there are more units of one kind in a population and less number of units of another kind in the, in the, in the population, and we want to select a sample size from each strata, stratum by using the proportional allocation, then we can use the second formula. So here we are just multiplying the total proportion of the population with the total uh, number of sample size. And sometimes it happens when we are going to select the sample, we should also think about the variations. So if there is large variation in, the, in a uh, group or in a stratum, then we usually try to pick more units from that so that we can get a representative sample from that group. And if we have less variation from a from a stratum, then we can pick the less unit that would be enough to represent that sample. And sometimes uh, researchers also consider the cost when they are going to select the sample from uh, the stratified sampling. And in that case, if some of the groups or some of the, uh, the stratum are costly, then we should try to get the smaller number of samples from that group. So these are just the formulas that I've uh, explained in a theoretical way. Uh, so this is how we conduct the, the stratified sampling. And other way of conducting the, uh, the sampling is the cluster sampling. And most of the time it is used when we conduct the surveys because uh, in that kind of sampling, we have a group which are already designed. For example, counties, electric, uh, electoral districts or city blocks or households. So it, so that sampling is used uh, if we want to conduct a uh, survey. And in that uh, situation, we usually divide the population into a larger number of clusters and then select a simple random sample of one cluster and then study all the units within that cluster. And this is uh, how uh, we can visualize this uh, uh, cluster sampling. So for example, there are North, East, West, we have different uh, uh, clusters here and we pick one of the cluster, and then we further study that cluster in that. So system, uh, I mean, cluster sampling is more often more uh, cost efficient than simple random sampling, particularly if the population is spread over a wide geographical uh, region. However, uh, cluster sampling often requires a larger sample size to produce uh, results as precise as those from the simple random sampling. And the reason is uh, within a cluster, we usually have heterogeneous units. So we have to take a larger uh, sample from, uh, from a cluster. So, so uh, the next uh, thing is uh, uh, systematic sampling. And uh, sometimes uh, we usually can use systematic sampling. Is, it is also not quasi uh, random sampling. So the idea is, for example, we, want, we, uh, we have 100 units and we want to select 50, a size of 50 uh, uh, units from, uh, from this population. So we divide this sample, uh, this 50, sorry, uh, let me just explain here. So we just partition the, 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 the N items in frame into G groups of K items. And then K is determined with using this formula. So this formula says that we have N items and we divide uh, it with the number of groups and then we get a specific integer and if it is in point, you can uh, use uh, another technique is use circular set, uh, sampling, but uh, another way of doing that, you can just uh, approximate it, it 
uh, it into a nearest integer and then select a sample. So for example, here we have 100 uh, groups. We have divided uh, uh, this in, uh, sorry, 100 population units. We have divided this into 50 groups. And then we get k, the value of k equals to two, right? And then from the first two uh, units, that would be, that constitutes a one group. And we have to pick a randomly one unit. And if that randomly selected unit is two, then thereafter we'll select the average second unit from the, the, the rest of the 50, uh, 49 groups. And that's how we select a systematic random uh, sample. So, these are uh, uh, the, the common sampling, uh, probability sampling techniques that we usually use in uh, quantitative, we, may, uh, we can use in quantitative research. But if you have any question about these uh, things, so please let me know and maybe we can just give two to three minutes for questions uh, for this part and then we can try to cover the rest of the presentation. No, I am actually getting excellent pedagogy. Man, who says I've never such a good form, good description of certified sampling in any research book. And so there are lots of, uh, they wanted the, uh, you know, there was just discussion among the groups. So I think we are good to go. If there's any question that I have missed, please rewrite it in the comments and I'll make sure I don't miss it. Please, we can proceed, Zishan. Very good. So, so, so now we look at some common uh, quantitative research designs. Uh, I'm not going into the depths of each of them, but I'm just going to give the, the, the basic uh, idea that how we can think of these designs. So one of them is the research, uh, survey research. So this is a kind of uh, research design in which the researcher uh, systematically asks a larger, uh, large number of people the same question and then record their uh, uh, Answers. For example, uh, a professor might have uh, might have uh, her st student complete a survey during class to understand the relationship between drug use and um, self esteem. And then we can also think of this design like uh, the Gallup surveys. Yeah. Then the second is experimental design, which is usually used by the researchers who are interested in determining whether a program policy or, or practice or intervention is effective. So if we want to know uh, whether, uh, uh, say, say, the boot camps uh, are effective at reducing juvenile dependency, then we can think of as experimental design, or this is mostly used in uh, biostatistics as well. And the third uh, one is cross-sectional design. And the fourth one is longitudinal design. So all the designs which I have listed here, these are time dependent. Either we, we have to think whether we are going to collect the data on a single point of time or multiple point of time. So if we are going to collect the data on a single point of time, uh, then we are mostly, uh, uh, I mean, thinking of cross-sectional uh, research. But if we are going to collect the information from many units or cases across more than one point of time, it means we are uh, going towards uh, longitudinal research. And there are three further uh, divisions of that kind of longitudinal research uh, that are usually uh, known as the time series research panel and cohort study. So time series is basically uh, that we select, uh, uh, observe the different people uh, at multiple times. And the panel is we try to observe or maybe collect the data, uh, exact the same people at two or more times, right? So for instance, if we are interested to know uh, uh, some characteristic about the people who are married in say 1986, right? And then after 10 years or maybe after nine or eight years, we want to know the how those characteristics that we have already asked them uh, have changed over time. This is how, how the panel uh, longitudinal data research is uh, can can be viewed. And then the cohort is uh, uh, it's something like we observe people who shared an experience or at two or more uh, uh, point of times. So, so case study is also is a kind of uh, research design, but that is more close towards the qualitative research where we usually have uh, a very small uh, subjects or uh, sample size and we try to uh, study them in depth. 
So this, this case study, which is listed here, this is uh, mostly related to or uh, to the qualitative research. But apart from that, the rest of these uh, four designs are constitutes as quantitative research designs. So uh, these these are the simple uh, designs that I wanted to talk about in that um, uh, section of the presentation. So if anyone has any question, then maybe yeah. we want to- Actually, there were two questions for the previous section that came, I think I missed. One was explain the main difference between stratified and cluster. Yeah. I think it was very evident, but anyway, if you could- uh, yeah. So, so, so the main, yeah, so, so the main difference is how the groups are formed. For example, if you think of uh, uh, stratified sampling, we uh, a researcher may form groups himself in a way that within a group, the variation should be minimum and a group from another group should be different. So so they, they those groups which constitutes or which comes under, uh, the stratified sampling, uh, they should have, th they are internally homogeneous and externally heterogeneous. But when we think of clusters, then those, cl those groups are internally heterogeneous and externally homogeneous. And mostly those clusters are already well developed in the form of electoral districts and entries. I hope it's clear now. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the difference in matching and balancing sampling of two groups? Uh, matching and balancing sampling, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Uh, Anul, could you please uh, clarify what do you intend to say? And I don't think we have any more questions. We will come back to you, Mahnoor, when you restate the question as to what you really want to know. Ji, you can make continue, Zisha. Okay, so, so, so now we uh, proceed towards the difference between the qualitative and quantitative research. So in simple words, if we are not sure how to proceed uh, for quantitative approach or qualitative approach, so just think about uh, whether you want to test a specific question, research question, or whether you want to confirm already existing theory. So if you want to confirm already existing theory, it means you have to pick quantitative approach. But if you want to explore a specific topic, uh, then you have to formulate hypothesis, then you can pick uh, qualitative research. So, so in quantitative research, we usually have numbers and we use statistical uh, methods in uh, an analysis and we try to pick larger sample sizes and the problem uh, in which we are interested in quantitative approach or research is the reliability. How representative sample we have, how the data is reliable, right? So this is uh, what we have in quantitative approach and we are more objective uh, in quantitative approach. On the other hand, if you look at the qualitative uh, research, so we usually have data in the form of non-numeric uh, for example, words, concepts, perceptions. So if you, if you want to know how someone is feeling about a specific phenomena, then it means we probably can't mirror it and then we can think of it in words. So here we usually don't uh, try to use statistical analysis. Instead, we use sister, uh, thematic analysis. And thematic analysis is, uh, for example, content analysis or discourse analysis, we usually try to use those techniques or sometimes the systematic uh, literature review as well to explore or to formulate our hypothesis. And other thing that we usually uh, have in qualitative research approach that it is more subjective. And here, the main thing is about the authenticity because we have a very small sample size, one, two or three people, and we want to know what they have said. So here the quality of information is more important than the sample size. Whereas on the other hand, on the, the quantitative approach, we are more interested uh, towards the, the reliability of the, the sample size in core issue in probability data. So, so these are the differences uh, between that. And if we think of a uh, qualitative research process, that's somehow the similar what we have already seen in quantitative research process. 
but there are a little bit difference in step one and step two. So what is step one? So in qualitative research, when you are going to conduct uh, some kind of uh, analysis or research, then you have to put yourself in your social constraints. So for example, uh, if you are thinking about a specific uh, topic from a ethnicity point of view, or whether you are thinking that from your religious perspective, so this, these are the things that we consider. And here, the process is not as linear as it was in the quantitative research. So here, sometimes the researchers try to back and forth from step three to seven. So this is how the qualitative research process is different from the quantitative research process. So often researchers not only use or test a past theory, but also develop new theories uh, in qualitative research processes. So at uh, these, the, these are the main differences. So, I, I mean, I, I still get the same questions from different people that uh, which approach should I use? So I always say, it doesn't matter which approach you are going to use, you have to first think about what are your research questions. So in simple words, if you are going to say test a theory, then go for quantitative approach. But if you want to say formulate a new theory, if you want to test the perceptions of something, uh, then you have to conduct interviews and the, the straightforward answer is uh, go towards the qualitative approach. But sometimes we are interested to conduct both of those things. And in that case, it means we have to look for mixed method research. But if you are a beginner, you don't have exposure, much exposure about research, then try to stick to one of them instead of uh, being uh, I mean, conducting the mixed method research. So last uh, topic is about um, uh, these uh, four key questions. And I think so I, I will probably take just one minute to uh, answer the questions. If anyone has any question about these two things, one or two questions. There are not many questions, but I think people keep coming back to asking for standard answers about sample sizes or whatever, and there are no standard answers. I think your sample size depends on what you are trying to do, on your population, on multiple variables that you want to include. And so I think there is no rule of thumb that will say that you will tell me this is what you know, I want to do, so what is the sample size? So I think that, may I suggest that you read about all these different topics, subtopics under the research design, and then start collecting, thinking about it. You'd be surprised how many things you will have to keep on rethinking before you even find an answer of what to do next. So even with a sample, you will have to do many much thinking even with your questions and a hypothesis you will have to you know do a lot of stuff so please it is unfortunate if you are a student that those are not questions that come easy with a lot of study and in-depth study of these different topics and there's no one answer for either so and I think that's what the two experts, the previous qualitative, Sara, and what Zishan is saying throughout. So um, please some, do some more reading. I do see that the people want resources. Mm. It says, my question is not in quantitative analysis. Uh, it is, uh, if there is a sample size, then how do you generalize your result to the larger sample size? I, I think I'm not wrong. I still don't understand. You're talking about qualitative analysis. If there's a sample size, then how to generalize your result to the sum large sample size because it's simple to the same population triggers. Your sample size is also in keeping. Yeah, Azishan, perhaps you can explain it better. Okay, so so the thing is when we talk about sample size in qualitative research, so as I've already said that the quality of information matters here and yeah. qualitative research is a subjective kind of approach. 
So, so probably we have the same questions. You have a same question. I have a same question and a third person have a same question, but we are finding a different conclusion in qualitative approach because we have different experiences. We are analyzing data in a different way, right? One thing. The second thing, uh, qualitative is a subjective approach. So, 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 so that's why it has just a very small sample size. So second question was, sorry, generalizability, yeah. So, so qualitative research cannot be generalized. And that's one of the back because that is subjective. And adding quantitative research, um, it is not always true that we should take a large sample. So the, the thing which matters in quantitative research is whether the sample is representative or not. So that's a key question. So if you have say small sample, uh, usually say, I mean, sometimes in books they say it's less than 20 or 30, right? Or sometimes 50. But that sample, uh, that sample is representative of the population, you are good to go for analysis. But if you are taking, say, uh, thousands of uh, sample, sampling units, but that sample is not representative of the all population, then there's no point to conduct the, uh, the analysis. So the, so the key point is in qualitative research, uh, generalizability, you can't generalize things. In quantitative research, you can generalize, but you should be sure to some extent with some margin of error that the sample is represented. I hope that is the uh, answer. Yeah, you. I think you did a good job. Uh, when you say subjective Zishan uh, research, I think people tend to misunderstand that it's not objective, objective, or scientific. I think you just mean to say that it is subjective because it's a perspective. It's a certain perspective that you're trying to give, but that doesn't mean that in scientific terms, it's still not scientific or objectively scientific. Yeah. If I can uh, sort of clarify that. Nobody asked that, but I know people get confused. Bakar Ahmed says, how can we use Monte Carlo simulation for a feasible sample size? And I have no clue what this is. Do you? <laughs> Ah, it's, it's, it's a kind of, uh, I haven't personally used that yet. You, so I yeah, I think we'll let that. it pass. I think we will sort of let it pass and perhaps try to come back to it when we share your response as a resource. So you can look at, you know, see if you can respond to this. Uh, very well explained in short, uh, spine, great job, sir. In quantitative research, we test hypotheses. Uh, let me see. Uh, sorry, where did it go? Seven new messages. I'm sorry. Uh, Mohammed Khlaq, in, in qualitative analysis, some, you did that, generalization. And then how can we use Monte Carlo done? In a quantitative research, we test hypotheses. While in qualitative research, we formulate a new hypothesis. I wouldn't necessarily, rather than proving or disproving one. Uh, can you please elaborate? I didn't think so, but nevertheless, if this makes sense to you. I haven't read research in a long while. You're asking to me? I, I, Zishan, he says, okay, we test hypotheses in quantitative research, right? In qualitative yeah. research, we formulate a new hypothesis rather than proving or disproving one. And I fail to understand this. Um, okay. Well, I would say it, it depends on the purpose of your research. Yes. For example, uh, if you have a specific hypothesis and uh, you want to take the site, either you are going to support that hypothesis or the statement or a few did, then you come up with evidences in the form of your arguments. Right? And then you further uh, come up with the conclusion and think, okay, so this hypothesis, whether it is it making sense or not, or should I think maybe some other thing. Yeah. But in quantitative research, usually we have theory and we want to test whether that theory, whether the data supports that theory or not, based hmm. on statistical matters. Hmm. So, so in short, uh, usually uh, we can, take the site or maybe the refute a specific hypothesis based on our arguments in qualitative research, but in we try to uh, test the theory. Okay. Because I think hypothesis would stay valid nevertheless. 
it depends on how, what research you are doing exactly. Yeah. Sometimes you just do a research question. And some people do a hypothesis or a null hypothesis and move with it. And depends on what you want to achieve. Uh, there is an assumption, no assumption in statistics that the sample size should be small. Please tell me about some advanced techniques for quantitative analysis. In what sense uh, you want me to give you? Because there are so many advanced techniques. Depends. Uh, I mean, if I tell you about my research, that probably haven't yet uh, that much. Uh, I mean, exposed to the, the the many statisticians. So that is also advanced research. So uh, if you ask this question specifically, in what sense, yeah. in what respect, then probably I would get the answer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there are lots of, uh, there are sites that are coming up. Please state what sites are these for, from Sahib al Um Then you can, okay, you can, very good, uh, Hafiz. You're saying these sites, you have posted some sites which can give guidance for your sample size. Excellent. What's this technique to select keywords and how are we coming here now? Uh, it seems that a lot of us uh, uh, participants is a mix of student body that has yet to go through some basic understanding of some uh, themes around research. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that this was not about clarifying and starting it from the ground up. Uh, so we had hoped that you would do, I, I think, some prior reading, and we had suggested that you re see the prior uh, slides and YouTube um, of our prior sessions before joining this session. So do we have to state our subjective biases while using qual qualitative approach and interpretative epistemology? Of course. Gee, Zishan. Yes, in fact, in qualitative uh, uh, research, uh, researcher usually is all, all so involved in the research. He gives yeah. his... Uh, I mean, understanding what how he looks the uh, a specific aspect of that topic. So usually that is uh, relatively more research biases involved in qualitative as compared to in quantitative. Mm -hmm. so, so because in quantitative research, we have numbers and we have to look how those numbers behave. So there could be a bias of maybe uh, collecting in those numbers, but maybe uh, there could be a bias of uh, in that kind of research because of selection of uh, wrong or maybe uh, inappropriate sampling design or things like that, but not as uh, as the way it was in qualitative research. So usually researcher is independent, is not involved as it is involved in qualitative research. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Martin Thomas has given a very good uh, difference between the two. Unfortunately, this session seems to be talking more about qualitative research, and this is about quantitative research. We had a prior session on this and had a very good expose. Uh, there's Baha says, what's the difference between hypothesis and statement of the problem in qualitative research? Uh, Baha, again, we have done with the qualitative, and but would you care to answer Zishan? Okay, what is the difference between hypothesis and statement of the problem in qualitative research? Uh, well, to be honest, I don't have much experience of doing qualitative research. Uh, I mostly do quantitative because I'm a client guy. Uh, yeah, I understand. So I think we'll let that pass and we'll try to look up the answer and send it to you if anybody in the audience would like to state an answer to that. We are happy to share. Can we have more than one research questions in quantitative research? I think yes. Why not? Um, depends on what is the length and scope of your uh, study and how much do you want to you think you can manage in that scope? Um, many people are saying thanks, and I think we had a very steady um, number around 200, um, and it went very well. Thank you so much, Zeeshan. Uh, only recently, please, would you, would you like to say something further? I see that a lot of our online participants have the children with them, and we're very happy to see young kids on our videos. 
uh, I, we have launched the polling. Please do. Um, uh, there's a question from Bushra Ashraf uh, Zishan from National University of Modern Languages. Is it possible to bo collect both quantitative and qualitative data simultaneously from the same sample? And what is the validity of such a data? G. From the same sample, what do you mean? Uh, yeah. Something like, uh, say, conducting an interviews? And I mean, I'm, I'm not quite clear about the no, question. Sure. question. Yeah, I think in, uh, somebody asked about mixed methods research. Please hold your horses. We will have another session of mixed methods research. And perhaps some of these questions would be more applicable over there. But I think when you say that you want to collect uh, from the same sample two types of data, I think it would depend on what you're trying to get out of it. Will it one is that from the same sample size, you start, that's the mixed method, or start with the quantitative data and then go into the qualitative um, ex expose of what you sort of did. But that's something like mixed methods research. And I think leave that question for that. Now, thank you so much. I would really appreciate if Dr. Zishan mentioned some of the best reading books on integrating data science and political science from the side of learning and honing research skills. Would you be able to recommend a book? Be happy if you do it after the session and put up some resources which we can share with people, the participants, right? Yeah, sure. So I think we will not waste time on that. It's possible for mixed method, yes, in language processing, yes. Can we have a se separate session on, se please see our sessions. We do have a separate session on systematic re review. Uh, thank you, Zishan, for an informative session. The fashion design hypothesis and statement of the problem are two different things, absolutely. Some researchers find real-life problems and find solutions. Such researchers must state the problem observed and explored. Absolutely. These are simple and what is a hypothesis. It would be great to have a whole lesson. Monica, yes, we have one, I think, demonstration on the session on SPSS and we will try to include next year one on NVivo. It will be um, uh, our expert trying to walk uh, through, but we won't have the facility to help you with a hands-on session. Can we only have one webinar per day? I would love to do it that way. It just so happens that when our experts are available, we try to uh, put them together and another one Two are coming day after on a Wednesday, but they're both very good seminars. So thank you so much. Who is putting cover on the slide here? Yeah, I do not know. There's a, something dark on the slide. Is there something to do? We love to join you again and again. We love to have you again and again. Please conduct a session on R as well. Every um, comment in this is, go is saved with us. We look at your comments and we try to improve our research sessions accordingly. We try to do as much as we can, but you know, you have to remember 20 session in two months is a lot of time <laughs> and we go crazy trying to organize this, but we'll definitely try to satisfy perhaps on a small, smaller section of more detailed things that you're asking for sometime in the coming year, academic year. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will, we're very happy. I see that there are a lot of satisfied 